The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of Owen TV's management, staff, or board of directors. Detroit Basketball! Hello and welcome to Views from the Sidelines, and it is, uh, it's basically like Malik's birthday today. Um, we're in December, December 1st, and as you can tell, the Michigan Wolverines have done what we thought was possibly impossible. Listen, man. That... And they did it. They beat Ohio State, and they are pretty securely in the college football playoff. All they have to do now is beat Iowa in the Big Ten championship game, which should be a breeze compared to Ohio State, but you never know with this crazy team. But there's hope. Malik, take the floor. Listen, first of all, let me just... Ugh, okay. Listen, this 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 game... I almost want to cry. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't. It is all the clips I've seen of like them winning the winning in the nineties and all the past games and memories of the great rivalry. It became real. It actually became real. And I didn't believe it until like the last minute. I I wasn't going to psych myself out. I wasn't going to kid myself. These things don't happen to Michigan in the past 20 years. Yep. And for them to win in the way they, the way they won. Offensive line was dominant. Yep. Aiden Hutchinson and Ojabo were ridiculous off the edge. Mm -hmm. Everybody did their part. Mike McDonald was really good on defense. Josh Gaddis called a perfect game. They were just ready. And they rode the coattails of Hassan Listen, Haskins. This this is the first time that a Michigan football team under Jim Harbaugh has looked. But since 2016, this is the first time a team has looked this ready and this focused mm -hmm. playing Ohio State. And when, when they stopped Ohio State on that fourth and 18 near the end, and Cade McNamara took that first knee, mm -hmm. and it started to set in. I I, I couldn't like I was speechless. Yeah, I was, honestly I fell down on one knee and I just I just stared at the screen because I couldn't believe what was happening. Mm -hmm. The fans rushing the field. Forty two twenty seven Michigan, like you said, Hassan Haskins, just running through tackles. First down after first down after first down. 169 yards and five rushing touchdowns, which is a rivalry record. Mm -hmm. Cade McNamara threw a pick, but then he came back and threw big time passes to keep them in the game and keep drives moving. CJ Stroud and those receivers are the real deal. Mm -hmm. two, of, two of the receivers went over 100 yards, and Chris Olave had 86 yards. Each of them had ridiculous catches to keep them in the game. Yep. And Michigan still dominated them. Yep. It just is. It's been. It's been so many days since the game, and I still. It's hard for me to to wrap my head around them. They dominated Ohio State. Mm -hmm. They actually did it. Yep. They brought their A game to the most important they did it. game. Yeah. 
And we haven't seen that from the Michigan team in a long time. And I think Michigan did a very good job of doing what exactly they needed to do, what Michigan State couldn't do, control the ground game, and you control the game. Yes, C.J. Stroud and that Ohio State offense cannot be stopped still. Uh, But Michigan slowed them down enough to where they could get the win and they could control the game using their running game. They didn't let Ohio State get out ahead. Um, and put Michigan into the into the back corner. Yeah, they they played the closest thing to a perfect game mm-hmm. that they could, and they they didn't need a bunch of turnovers. Ohio State fumbled the ball three times and got it back all three times. Yep. Michigan turned the ball over more than Ohio State, and Michigan still won. Mm-hmm. All the unlucky years, all the bad breaks, all the. Teams with that get punched in the mouth and don't respond. This makes up for all those years and the years Jim Harbaugh hasn't won. There was no there was nothing fluke about it. There was they they just came out and handled their business. Mm-hmm. And they did what they did what Michigan fans want to see and have always wanted to see out of a Jim Harbaugh team. A tough physical team that takes it to more talented opponents and just breaks them. Yep. And that's what they did. It was it was beautiful to watch. It really was. Yeah. And now, like I said, they look ahead to to Iowa, which I mean, yes, Iowa is that they're still ten and two. They're a team that we thought was going to be better. <laughs> but we found out that their offense can't really do anything. It took Nebraska falling apart for them to get to the Big Ten Championship. No, and Wisconsin. Yes, them and Wisconsin apart. falling apart. And so they've made it. But it should be a win for Michigan. And that securely puts them at number two. Um, Georgia's going to play Alabama in the SEC Championship. So... Pretty much, I mean, even if Alabama loses, I don't see a whole lot changing. Maybe Alabama goes down to four. If Alabama loses, I don't think they make the playoff. Really? I See, it, well, unfortunately. There, there's so many. Oklahoma State has to win. Yeah. And yeah, Oklahoma State and Cincinnati have to win. Yeah. For them to be out. Right. Which, it, all these things are up in the air. Yeah, I'm just scared that the committee is going to do something to get Alabama in there. Um, that, that's the only thing that makes me nervous. But yeah, Oklahoma State has now put themselves in a spot to be able to make it in. And Cincinnati, of course, still sits on the very edge of their seats. Unfortunately, I feel bad for that program just because you go undefeated and you still have a chance to miss the college football playoff because of the way that it works. Yeah, um, It's a little disappointing, but we'll see what happens. A lot of championship games to be played. Um, I will mention real quick the Michigan State got it done against Penn State. They finished ten and two. Which no, is, that that it was snowing in in Ann Arbor, but it was almost a snowstorm in in Lansing. Yeah, the field was completely white. Yep, and uh, Michigan State did got did a great job honestly in that game. Um, they only came out thirty to twenty seven, but they they played well all around. I think, and they did what they needed to do. And, uh, yeah, they got the win, so their season was capped off superbly. Nobody predicted a 10-win season for them in season two. No, that they're going to be – they're going to have a good bowl game, which is going to be – it's going to be fun. Um, Any other teams you wanted to talk about before we get into – I want to talk about the coaching stuff real quick. Um, Well, before we get to the coaching stuff, I'm just going to predict a score for the Michigan game. Michigan Iowa. Yes, Michigan Iowa. I am going to go thirty five to ten. I think Iowa's defense is tough and I think Kirk Ferentz is gonna come out with a really good game plan in the first half. Much like kind of like Wisconsin early in the season. Michigan mm-hmm. won that game thirty eight to seventeen, I believe. Michigan could hit forty two, but I don't think they just like set off fireworks in this one. Yeah. Iowa their their defense is so fundamentally sound and they rarely make mistakes now Purdue took advantage of them Mm -hmm. 
and a few other teams did too. So it's possible, especially if Gaddis calls another really good game. But I'm going to go – actually, I'll go 38-10. to 10. I'll throw a field goal in there. Okay. So they – not anything crazy, but still a uh, blowout win. Yeah. I won't even predict a score because I just think Michigan, the way their offensive line and their running game looked, I think they'll be able to wear down the Iowa defense. And if Iowa's defense isn't going to win the game, their offense is definitely not going to win. Exactly. The game. So that'll be my thing. Um, oh, one last thing before we get to the coaches. Your boy Kenny Pickett playing Amen. against Wake Forest for the ACC championship. He he's earned all my respect. <laughs> he I, it's to the point now where I'm not a Steelers fan anymore, but I still have most of my family Steelers fans. I've been telling them for the past month, draft Kenny Pickett. He's right there in your backyard. He's ready to play. Big Ben is out in a year or two. Slide Kenny Pickett in there. Yeah. I think he's good enough. He's confident enough. enough and he has the experience. You, well, and that receiving core is very talented. Ex- exactly. Now, they still need to rebuild that O-line, which is a complete mess. We'll get to them when we get to the NFL picks. They're just yeah. a mess overall. Right. But, yeah, Kenny Pickett, you have all, all my respect. I yeah. hope they will, even though I, I love the Wake Forest story. Yeah. But I hope Pitt wins that championship and Kenny Pickett gets even more of a – he should almost be in New York. Yeah. For the Heisman presentation. Yep. Um, some crazy things happened in the, the coaching world of college football. In my opinion, I think it's kind of crazy because. It's more than just kind of. It's, it's big names leaving big schools to go to other, other big, big schools. It's, it's an unprecedented time we're in. Uh, so Lincoln Riley has decided to leave Oklahoma and he's going to go coach USC next year. And with that, the what is it? The number two quarterback recruit in twenty twenty three yeah. has already decided already that he flipped. is going to USC now. Oklahoma has had like six kids decommit in the past three days. Yeah, a, f- a, a few of them are also predicted to flip over to USC soon. Yeah, which to me is crazy how that that kind of stuff happens. I, I mean, I know I know it happens, um, but it's just ridiculous. I I think. Um, and then, uh, Brian Kelly, Notre Dame. This was the shocking one to me. This was the one that I don't think anybody expected him to leave Notre Dame. I think everybody thought he would ret- he retire there. I was going to say for him to just step off of Notre Dame, which seems like he's been there forever. And the, now. They, they still have a chance to make the playoff. That's the craziest right, like part. Like they are. Like they're in the midst of an eleven and one season, yes. And he decides he's going to LSU. That if that doesn't tell you that money talks, I don't know Listen. what will. And the crazy and and now, like I said, now Notre Dame has an open vacancy, and Oklahoma has open open vacancy. So now those it it just moves from like big schools needing coaches to the next big schools needing coaches, and it's created this crazy carousel. I think that I. I don't even know what's going to happen now. Yeah, I I think this is just a sign of where things are going. Yeah. And honestly, Notre Dame fans are criticizing Brian Kelly a lot, but when you look at it, I think it's clear at this point that Notre Dame has a ceiling. Mm-hmm. Now, Notre Dame does have like the fourth best recruiting class this year and the number two class in 2023 so far. Yeah. So the level of talent has been raising, but – when you keep getting into the playoff at those third and fourth slots, yeah, the difference between three and four and one and two we've seen is a clear difference. Yep. And as long as you keep staying around that area, and there's a fact that they've never hit on that elite special quarterback at Notre Dame, mm-hmm. Brian Kelly isn't getting any younger. I think he's 60, 61. He's around there. Yeah. He wants to go somewhere where the, the resources are unlimited, the talent pool is unlimited, he can get kids that he usually won't take at Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. He can just go for it all in these next five or six years. Yeah. And how, can you really blame him for that? No, I mean, I get it. I mean, The way he left is awkward. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I agree with that. Um, yeah, how do you feel about it? I don't know. I mean, I don't like Notre Dame, so if it hurts Notre Dame in the long run, I'm cool with it. Um, but, yeah, I, I'm – 
people always talk about like players wanting to get a change of scenery, needing a change of scenery. I'm happy you're bringing this. Up. Sometimes coaches need that kind of thing too. Like Notre Dame is there every year, but they just cannot break through. Like you're saying, maybe you get old enough, you get tired of that, and you just want to see if getting those more resources that LSU has that maybe you can break through. Who knows? Maybe it works out. Maybe it doesn't. But at some point, you have to take that risk, I think, even as a coach. And same thing, especially for Lincoln Riley. Like, Oklahoma, we know what Oklahoma is at this point. They're a team that can put up 50 every night. With other but they team, can give up 50 exactly. every night. So to go to a school, a change of school, go to USC, different program, uh, probably a more historic team. Uh, that hasn't been much of anything in the last, I don't know. What would you could you say, say like, decade. Honestly. I was going to say like 10 to 15 years. Outside of the Rose Bowl, they won with Sam Darnold. You got to yeah. go back to Pete Carroll. Right. So uh, somebody that can revive that team would be heralded as, as a coach. It's, it's something the Pac-12 needs a lot too. Because mm-hmm. you see Oregon has been rising. Utah almost made the playoff last year, but messed it up at the last minute. You need another coach like Lincoln Riley to come in and raise the profile of the Pac-12 yeah. so that respect can come back. Mm-hmm. And you see this season, the stands have been empty at USC games. That's not how it's supposed to be. Right. The, the stands are supposed to be full. There's supposed to be celebrity support. And there's supposed to be a high-level coach and the highest level of players. Yeah. Players have been leaving California to go to Clemson, Alabama, out of the past like five years, there have been top quarterbacks coming out of out coming out of California every year, right. and they leave. Mm-hmm. Now they're going you, to the southern the southern schools. Exactly. You saw the kid that was going to Oklahoma, the quarterback. He's already flipped to USC. Mm-hmm. These kids are going to start staying home to play for Lincoln Riley. Yeah. But I'm happy you brought up the player aspect of it. To me, this shows more of the fact that the old school mentality of the players should pick a school, not a coach. That's officially time for that to die. Yeah. Because the school does not have your best interest as a player. Right. And I don't know why people keep thinking that, yes, the education is key. Yeah. Yes, you make relationships with those players and those coaches that will yeah. last for years. Mm-hmm. But if you're a top player or a player that has a pro future, yeah, why would you stay at a school where a new coach is coming in he doesn't have your interest at heart. Right, yeah. Either you follow the coach or go somewhere better. Mm-hmm. And now that the, tran- the transfer portal is basically free agency for college football now. Mm-hmm. It's the best time for, fo- for players. And the, the number of players going into the portal has become more and more. Recently, there are a lot of kids going into the portal, high-level players too. Yep. So coaches are flipping, players are flipping. It's kind of being like the wild, wild west in college football, which is making it even more interesting. So. Yeah. I'm liking where it is. Mm-hmm. It, it's just going to get more crazy, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's cool. I I enjoy it. Um, but, yeah, now we move on to uh, championship weekend. Um, we got some big games coming up for all these schools. And then um, we'll find out who's going to be in the college football playoff. And all that. It's, it's going to be crazy. And now I don't – I mean, is C.J. Stroud still the Heisman? I think if Kenny Pickett balls out in this ACC championship, I think he can make it, and they win. I don't see. I don't see how you put C.J. Stroud over Kenny Pickett. Yeah, with this season Pitt is having. Yeah, no, I, I can agree with that. I'm just, I'm just saying because, you know, before the Michigan State Ohio State game, it was Kenneth Walker almost, bar none, and then they lose, and C.J. Stroud balls out in that game. Everybody jumps on C.J. Stroud. Now he just had another good game, but they lost. So now they've lost two games on the season. I, I don't know. And can you really give it to, like, Matt Corral or, I don't know, I guess Kenny Pickett's the other one. So out of those guys, they've all kind of stumbled at some point during the season. But I don't know. It's it's hard to say, but it's interesting, I think, that there's no clear cut this year. They usually go with the guys with the hottest hands near the end of the season. Yeah. So – I would prefer Kenny Pickett, not just being against Ohio State, but yeah. Kenny has – his numbers are even better than C.J. Stroud's. Yeah. And him putting Pitt in this in this situation 
It right. deserves even more praise. Yeah, and he ca- he carried his team a little bit more. I exactly. Think. Yeah. Um. All right. Wait, let's go over to basketball, college basketball, real quick. Um, there's not a ton to talk about. It's like Michigan and Michigan State played in a couple uh, little tournaments, or Michigan State played in a little tournament battle for Atlantis um, over Thanksgiving break, and they looked pretty good. Yeah. They, they they took care of business for the most part. Um, they beat UConn, who was ranked 22 at the time, um, made it to the championship game against Baylor. Kind of got routed towards the end, but it was back to Michigan State not being able being able to make a shot and turning the ball over a lot. And that's kind of been their whole issue this whole season. Um, but they're ranked now. Kind of figured they would be, and they're they're a team that can play with almost anybody, but they can, they're can they almost at that point where they can lose to almost anybody, which is scary. Um, if their shot's not falling and they're turning the ball over, it's hard to win games. So it's, it's going to be a rough season, like we keep saying about Michigan State. And then Michigan, they only played a couple little games. Um, not really anybody of note, but Big Ten ACC Challenge has started, and Michigan is going to be playing North Carolina. State's going to be playing Louisville. So those will be some big games for both of these teams to see uh, what they're going to look like going forward. But the biggest news, I guess, because it's not so big anymore, is that Duke took care of Gonzaga um, which over the holiday break. Yeah, the matchup between Paolo Benchero and Chet Holmgren. Yeah. Paolo had 20 in the first half. He was He looked like an absolute stud. Yep. Chet didn't really get going to the second half, but he ended with 16. He still looked good. Yeah. They're two, they should both be like in the hunt for a yeah. championship. They're both high-level teams. The, the only thing that I will say about that game, I, I said it in our group text, but my the one concern about Paolo now is he has Reggie Jackson syndrome. I wouldn't say he has Reggie Jackson syndrome. I'm just syndrome. nervous about it. When I see a guy, especially in college, have to go out for an extended period of time due to cramps. And I, I've been known to call people out for getting cramps in games because I, I just don't understand it, I guess. Well, dur- during the Ohio State game last night, they said he he sweats an extreme amount and he loses a lot of energy yeah. the longer he plays. So that's just like a – that's a very specific thing that I haven't seen with Which many athletes. Which means you got to get that guy – Four bottles of water. They they said they they had to find something specific for him to drink during games. He's gonna to need maintain energy, like actual electrolyte stuff. Yeah. Plus maybe a couple bananas. I, I I don't know. It just it's a weird thing that I see from time to time, and it just it's I don't know if it, it's like and, and it kind of annoys me, I guess. <laughs> so I mean, it, you it's, I know it's they very can't control it. It's very picky. It's very cynical. Yeah. But like I don't know. That's just that's just my opinion sometimes. Because, like, in that game, it could have hurt their team. Anyway, I digress. Um, so then Duke took over the number one slot, and they've been looking pretty good. But they just lost last night to Ohio State, who had fallen out of the rankings previously. Um, and it just goes to show you again, college basketball, I, I don't know who's yeah. going to win night first in night First month out. of the season, almost pretty much nobody's safe. Yeah. The first month of the season. Yeah. Anybody can get popped. Right. We're no longer at that point where Kentucky's going to go undefeated or Gonzaga's going to go undefeated anymore because they're playing bigger bigger teams earlier on in the season. Like We just don't see that anymore, which I, I still love it. Um, but, yeah, it, it, it makes it fun to watch because you don't know who's going to take control. And it takes a while for teams to get going. Purdue right now, I guess, is – I mean, they're basically now slotted into the number one slot. But how long will they survive? They got Big Ten play coming up, and then who knows what's going to happen. Yeah, Kansas got upset by Dayton mm-hmm. in their small preseason tournament in Florida. Yep. So, yeah. yeah, We'll, Iowa, we'll I, get to Purdue because they, they look like a juggernaut right now. But, yeah. Iowa State looked insane. And they their, beat the mess out of Memphis. In yeah. their tournament. They yeah. might be back. And uh, I love – I've said it before, and I was saying it over Thanksgiving break um, to my dad and my uncle that – I just love the way that the Iowa State program plays the game of basketball. They play hard defense. They move the ball. They get easy buckets. And that's kind of how they've always been um, over this last so many years. 
and it's just a fun team to watch. So I'm I'm with you. I'm glad that they're back. They had a down season last year, um, but it looks like they should be somewhat back on track. Um, speaking of Memphis, they've looked decent, but you can definitely see the youth in Jalen Duran and Amani Bates. There's a lot of AAU basketball going on yeah, when they're playing. And it's a concern, I would say, that we're getting a lot of these kids that are coming from these AAU ball is life type things. Like I even just watched recently um, Mikey Williams in his high school game yeah. get beat down by this other team. And it's like a lot of these kids just think that they're, they're just going to win every night when they don't realize on the other side of the, on the other side of the court is like a team that's almost as talented but they just want it a little bit more. And a lot of these kids have been gifted so many things early on. It's just like Amani Bates, you can see he gets frustrated um, when somebody makes a move on him or he doesn't make a shot or he gets contested. And I don't know. It's, it's a concern to see that. And you see that more and more, I think, as like college basketball, even the NBA has evolved is like they're getting these kids that are seeing being seen younger and younger is that affecting them? I don't know, but it it is affecting a few of these kids. Mikey Williams is one where I've seen I've been watching him for two or three years, and I still have no idea what to think about him. Yeah, because guys like him that blow up when you're 13, they're dunking at 13. Right. Social media star outside of Lamelo, how many of those kids have really right shown up and grown into something? Yeah, more. Well, and I I always bring it up when I'm with my brother because we always like to talk old school basketball one of the first names that i ever remember being in social media um basketball early on seventh woods yes also yes. unfortunately one of the biggest social media busts college busts yeah got to unc didn't play a whole lot and just was gone and this he was one of those kids where people thought he was going to become the next the next guy and it never happened. So that that I think that becomes a concern these days for me personally. And so far, Imani Bates, Jalen Dern a little bit to the to that extent. I'm starting to see it a little bit. Well, they they're but di- I see they're t- different because they they have the Jalen Duran is just a man child. He's yeah. an absolute monster of a young kid. Yeah. And the the problem with Amani isn't talent. Right, exactly. We don't know where he will go mentally as the years go on. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I was going to bring that up. It's it's definitely not a talent thing. It's more of the mental side, yeah. but it is a slight concern. Um but we'll we'll just have to see. Again, they're super young. They they came to college basketball early. Um so they have a little more growing up to do and hopefully they'll get there. Um but it's just something to watch out for. The team is going to be good, I think, still this year, but just, it's just interesting, I guess. Um, anything else you wanted to point out on um, college basketball? I know you wanted to say Purdue real quick. Uh, yeah, I I think I think it might pan out for most of the season, at least half the season. Purdue is by far the best team in the country to me. They they are about ten deep. They have two dominant big men. They're deep at the guard position, and Jaden Ivey is looking like a superstar. The Big Ten is always tough, but I still think it's going to be hard for teams to go at them because of how good they are overall and how well-coached they are. Mm -hmm. But over that, Michigan playing North Carolina tonight, I'm really interested to see how they respond after the ups and downs they've gone through already so far. Mm -hmm. Because their last game was against small school Tarleton State who also just put up a really good game against another Power 16. But, yeah, they are still in the process of figuring out what their lineups are, who who can they trust mm-hmm. out of the young group. Some guys <clears throat> are coming up. Uh, some guys are falling back a little. I want to see how that continues at North Carolina against a experienced North Carolina team. Yeah. Who plays tough, who falls back, and who can step up in the moments – where they yeah. really need them. I think North Carolina might ultimately win. If it was at Michigan, I think I'd give them a slight chance more to win, but I think I'm going to give it to North Carolina. And the MSU-Louisville game, I think it's kind of a toss-up. Yeah. Because I think Louisville has more 
like individually talented players, but MSU is just they're tough and experienced. They don't they still haven't figured out that one guy that can take over games. Mm-hmm. They have to play good team basketball in order to win on both sides. Yeah. And they have the ability to do it cuz they've shown it. Right. But yeah, yeah. against it, teams like Louisville, I, w- I want to see yeah, how they the, the thing that I saw though with Michigan State which is concerning because it was a concern going into the season they got destroyed on the glass in almost every game especially UConn they almost lost because of offensive rebounds they got blocked 13 times by UConn because they're a small team now like Technically speaking, they have a lot of forwards and things. They don't have too many little guards. So you would think that they're naturally bigger, but they are all that 6'7 to 6'9 range. And besides Marcus Bingham, they don't have any big guys. Sissoko is their yeah, only that, other Sissoko center. Sissoko is still so raw. and he's, It seems like his development just hasn't yeah. been there. And he's still only 6'9. Like he's a small center. And those are the only two centers that this team has. And so it's not that small ball doesn't work in college basketball, but if you're not shooting the lights out, the small ball doesn't. There's not much advantage to it. And Michigan State has struggled mightily shooting the ball. And so there's some concerns there. I, I still think they are. They have so much talent, and they, are, they should be a very deep team. But there's just something off about the team right now, and I think – if they can figure that out, they'll be fine. But right now, it's a little nerve-wracking to watch. Watching some of those games, like, they looked really good in stretches, and then they looked really, really bad in other stretches. Yeah, they're they're good enough to beat good teams, but once they get to that next level, it's clear that there's a difference between them and those upper-tier yeah. teams. Yep. So, like I said, again, both these teams, Michigan and Michigan State, they got a lot to figure out, but, again, the Big Ten will, will shape you. So, we'll be able to see them. I, I still think they're going to be – I mean, I, I can't see them not being tournament teams. It just it, – they might kind of, I don't know, stumble their way into the tournament, I guess. But once they're in the tournament, they can be dangerous, I think. So we'll, we'll just have to kind of wait and see. One thing I wanted to mention real quick in professional sports um, before we get to the NBA and stuff real quick. The Tigers did sign Javier Baez – to a six-year, $140 million deal. I think he has a it's a two-year um, player option to opt out if he wants. Um, it's kind of exciting because it's a big name, but I know a lot of fans wanted Carlos Correa, but they got concerned about the money and his health because he's had so many back issues and things, and he doesn't really – he doesn't do a whole lot offensively. And so Javier Baez, a little bit better offensively. He can also switch between second and shortstop. Um, so there, there's some prospects in the minors that the Tigers have that they also think could be paired with Baez in the future. And six years, $140 million, doesn't seem like a bad deal to me. I have a friend. I've, I've brought him up about possibly coming on the podcast before. My friend Alex, who's a major baseball fan and he is beyond pissed really at the tigers right now he has been on social media going at fans he has been texting group chats going crazy swearing off the tigers he's serious about this Hmm. and he thinks they could have he was betting on the correa signing so he wanted them even though javier baez is a good signing yeah so he wanted them to go all in which i can i can understand that um, I, and because they've had a history this past decade, besides the winning teams, yes, of not going for right. specific things when they need to, yes, they're very they're very similar to the Lions recently, where any risk at all, they're not going to take it. They're not. They're just not. They don't care. Um, they're going to play play it safe. They're going to play it their way, and see what happens. Um, but yeah, so I I can see that. But um, I don't know. It's interesting. Obviously, we won't be able to figure it out for a while, but between Baez and uh, Eduardo Rodriguez, not a terrible offseason, I guess. I don't know. 
it's it's something. The Tigers are still right there. They're looking to get better this next season and maybe look for a playoff push. We'll see. Just wanted to mention it. Um, NBA basketball, again, we're in that weird part of the season. Not a ton going on, but the Suns still have not lost. I think there is a good amount going on. It's just there's there's so many teams going through ups and downs. Right. It is hard to pinpoint specific things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We don't have enough time <laughs> to cover all the little yeah. things. Um, but the Suns, they just beat the Warriors. Steph Curry had a really bad game. And uh, the Suns did not lose in the month of November. And they've won, what is it, 17 games in a row now? Yes. Uh, so the Suns are one of the hottest teams in the league, no pun intended. And yeah, the West is the West is getting fun because it's the Warriors and the Suns kind of pulling away with things. The East is still kind of a battleground. The Nets and Knicks it's, faced off. It's going to be a battle all season. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Nets and Knicks faced off. Knicks only lost by two, even when Durant and Harden both had good games. So that's a positive sign. James Harden had a tip dunk last night. Yeah. He his energy was on a level I haven't seen in a while. Yeah. Also, speaking about the Knicks. They have a pro- they have problems. Mm-hmm. They have f- several problems. Yeah. Outside of not having a superstar, they just die every third quarter. Yeah. They they just fall off the map, and the bench has to come in and save them. Yeah. Derrick Rose, Emmanuel Quickly, Obi Toppin, all those guys just have to come in and be a spark. Yeah. And either they barely win or they barely lose every game. Yeah. I do it has think- to be agonizing for Knicks fans. I do think Tom Thibodeau has done it right though. He decided finally that he's going to sit Kemba Walker, no yeah. longer part of the rotation. Alec Burks. It's unfortunate for Kemba Walker the way his career has just completely 180. Yeah. Um, but it just looks like that's the case. And Alec Burks is playing like he did before he got injured all those years ago. So it's kind of cool to see in that fashion. But yeah, they're still kind of struggling with not having a superstar. Um, obviously, Julius Randle is a, a star. He's close. But... Not quite there, but yeah, Knicks fans have something to be positive about. Yeah. There's also the the theory over the past like ten years that Tibbs runs his teams into the ground mm-hmm. once it gets to playoff times, and after so many years together, so we'll we'll have to keep track of that one. Yeah, because they they do he demands they play very hard, right? Almost every game. Yep, and uh, we'll mention the Pistons real quick. Pistons are still. They're meddling down there at the bottom. Um, yes. Cade Cunningham has played well. The rest of the team has not. They have become the Detroit Spartans, and they can't shoot the ball. And it's just looked rough. Like last year, they were competing in a lot of games. This year, getting blown out in a lot of games. It. How do you explain the fact that they can't? I mean, they don't have a bunch of high-level shooters, yeah. yes. But last year, Sadiq Bey showed the like, he showed that he could become yeah that dependable shooter. He early, still could. Early on in the season, he was a Rookie of the Year candidate. Yes, against like Lamelo Ball and guys like that. So he's know. he's hot or cold. Jerry and Grant is hot or cold. Yep. Kate is still hot or cold, but he was hot last night. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you, when Trey Lyles is one of your best shooters. Yeah. Kelly Olenek is out. Frank Jackson, he comes in and just jacks all the time. Mm -hmm. It's a very weird position. Yep. Very strange. Yeah. So many more moves to be made. (laughs) Right. So, again, not a whole lot to go off on that front. One funny thing that I will mention real quick, last thing about NBA. The Rockets have been undefeated without Jalen Green. Uh, We we can't really read into that. I can. I mean, of course, when you – I will. It's – like the Warriors last year, when you focus more on a rookie, when you focus more on that than winning games, of course there are going to be some losses. But yeah, I just think it's kind of funny. You know, the guy that wanted to be the number one pick thought he demanded to be the number one pick. His team's doing better without him. I mean, yeah, obviously it's forget Jalen Green. Yeah, saying all that stuff. Right. But I'm not reading that much into it. Yeah. We'll we'll see. We'll see. He still could be a really good player. All righty. NFL pick time. Here we go. I caught you by one last week. I got ten mm. correct. You got nine. Okay. Um, we did make a mistake, but I don't think it would have changed anything. Uh, we 
we missed the Chargers Broncos game. Oh, <laughs> okay. I'll tell you right now, oh. I would have picked the Chargers, hmm. uh, and the Broncos pretty handily won the game. It's I, something up with the Chargers, man. I I don't know if we would have picked the Broncos. Maybe you would have just for a fun pick, um, but maybe not realistically. I, I don't know. I couldn't see myself doing it. I'm just gonna. You have to start taking a lot of chances if you want to catch yeah, up to me. I, That's all I know. I've haven't. You have to start able, taking a lot of chances. I haven't been able to make up a lot of ground. So yeah. you said at 106. There's, there's no playing safe at this point. You said at 106. I said at 98. There is. Yeah. What do we got? Five weeks left. So, yeah. So so you, do you want to play it safe and ship away, or do everything you can to try and win this thing? I don't know. I haven't decided yet. So it's a. Or you could pick another. Is it's all up to you? What strategy will you go with? Thursday night, Dallas Cowboys at the New Orleans Saints. Taysom Hill maybe starting. Alvin Kamara maybe playing. Mark Ingram supposedly playing. Um, Dallas also. CD Lamb is supposed to be playing. Amari Cooper now is saying that they were going to play, even though he said previously that he wasn't going to play. Um, coming off of COVID, Ezekiel Elliott's a little banged up. But he's supposed to play. So who knows what's happening with either one of these teams. Um, I just think Dallas is the better team. I have to go with Dallas. I love the fact that they lost to the Raiders. Uh, I, I just I enjoyed it, it so much. It was great. It was great. But I'm taking the Cowboys, too. Yeah, I don't trust this New Orleans team right yeah. now. New Orleans is a good defense, I guess. But, I mean, their offense is so weird. You never know who's going to play. Yeah. Um, Minnesota at Detroit. Dalvin Cook is out. Hey, listen. What what are your feelings on that coach right now? Can we not talk about this? Because it seems like we have to. I tried to avoid talking about the things. We have game. to. It seems like he's losing ground with the fan base with these decisions. I will say that last week was the first time I was concerned about Dan Campbell. Listen, last like, three. For sure. 16-16, 13-10, 16-14. 10, Just the fact that they can't get over like... And 16 points. I have said it. I will back Dan Campbell up. I also did not know that you can't call back-to-back timeouts. I didn't know that was a rule. However, the biggest mistake that he made in that game was the last play of the game. I kept saying... It, it was funny because we were watching the game after eating Thanksgiving, and you know, there's, I don't know, six and a half minutes left in the game, and... They're, the Bears are sitting at, what, the 45 or something on their side of the field? And my dad's like, they can't, they can probably just run the game out right from here. And I was like, six and a half minutes? I don't think so. And that's basically what they do. Yeah. <laughs> and they get towards, they got into about the red zone is kind of where I said, you know, at this point, it's better to let them score. And the Lions line up for a third and what was it, third and five at the 10? And their defensive backs are basically in the end zone. And that right there told me either one, Dan Campbell is in the defensive coordinator. They are not paying attention. Or the players are not paying attention. To both red flags. Yes. And you, I mean, anybody that knows the slightest about football would say that doesn't look right because if they get a first down, the game is over, but we're going to give up a first down. That was the biggest concern for me because like I said, at that point, you might as well just protect the first down and let them go into the end zone. When they got to, I think there was like a second down run play that they were lined up for. And I said, this is where they do what they did to the Falcons last year. Let them through the line. See if they'll go and score. Because that's that's like the only way we need the ball back. And they didn't, it was just, it looked terrible for a while. And I don't know. So you're taking the Lions this week is what you're saying. No. <laughs> I told you their one faith was maybe through Thanksgiving. Now maybe they can beat the Falcons. No, no, Maybe. no, Dalvin Cook. Yeah, but Alexander Madison. Well, they didn't have Dalvin Cook when they played us early in the season, and Alexander Madison ran for over 100 yards on us. Kirk Cousins is having one hell of a season. Underrated. Vikings. We keep talking about it. Underrated. 
Justin Jefferson is playing like a top five receiver at the moment. Yeah. And Adam Thielen is their red zone guy. Just dependable. Yeah. Tampa Bay at Atlanta. Tampa Bay. Tampa can't. Bay just keeps barely scraping. Yeah. They looked dead to rights in that Colts game and they just clawed back into it. Yeah, Leonard Fournette probably finally had a Leonard Fournette game. Yeah, that was weird. I haven't seen that Leonard Fournette yeah, in a long time. He still time. has it in him. It's just they don't use it that much. Yep. They really don't need to a lot, which they should use them more. Yeah. I guess I'm going to have to play safe for a little bit. I'm going Tampa Bay. Come on, Malik. I already put you down for Tampa Bay. <laughs> don't ruin this. Well, for since you put me down for Tampa Bay, I guess I'm going to take Tampa. Listen, you, you got to let me weigh these things. Listen, I, I have. Do you a, believe in Matty Ice I have Mercedes Benz Stadium? I have a strategy on the fly just as well as you do. Yeah. The Falcons almost beat them last time they played. Okay, then pay, take the Falcons. I'm not taking the Falcons. They got Cordero Patterson back. He looks pretty good. You you wrote down the Buccaneers, so I'm I'm going with you. I mean, my words aren't set in stone. I'm, I'm going with you. Tampa <laughs> Bay. Cardinals at Soldier Field and the Chicago Bears. Is Kyler playing? Uh, he's supposed to. He's supposed to be on track to play. DeAndre Hopkins is supposed to be on track to play. Obviously, it's not a given. I'm still not playing around. Give me the Give me the Cardinals. But, uh, I don't trust the Bears. I mean, it's been proven that even when Arizona doesn't have those guys, they can win. They got to get Matt Nagy out of there. All right. I got to go with that again. Chargers at Cincinnati. Chargers are one of the weirdest carousel teams. Tar- the Chargers could, might- could win this game. And they could lose this game. Yes. <laughs> Very easily. It's a big 50-50. And, and you have to take a chance, sir. Yes. So you want me to pick first then? I'm not asking you to pick first. All I said is you have to take chances. All right. I'm riding with the hot hand. I'm going with Cincinnati. Okay. Joe Mixon's looked good on the ground. Joe Burrow didn't have to do a whole lot in this in that last game. I assume he'll probably do more, have to do more in this game, but they have the talent to do it. Their defense has looked way better this year. So. I'm also taking Cincinnati. Dang it. I don't like that strategy. Giants at Miami. Giants. Can I pick first? <laughs> yes. Giants won an ugly game against Listen. Philly. These past few weeks, it's it's been looking like a, uh, it's been looking like two a time these past few weeks. And Jalen Waddle, that offense has been looking good. They finally begin to waddle on track, and the Giants are somewhat of an about a football abomination. <laughs> they they are. They can't stay healthy. They barely make. They just fired Jason Garrett, so they're, who knows what they're going to call an offense. Yep. Give me the Dolphins. Darn it. This is why you wanted to pick first. Well, I'm going to take the Giants then. Uh, They're coming off a bye. Everybody should be healthy. I think Kadarius Toney, Kenny Galladay, Sterling Shepard's supposed to be back. Saquon's back. Daniel Jones might not play, though. It might be Mike Glennon. Oh, Oh, the guy they keep signing. Uh, He just... He finds a way. He has he has he's blackmailed somebody in the NFL. Yeah. He's gonna get a job until he's forty. Yeah. The only thing that Mike Glennon does well, he can push the ball downfield. He has a long neck. <laughs> That's all I know about Mike Glennon. He was good at NC State. Anyway, he can push the ball downfield. Sure. Maybe that's what the Giants need. I'm gonna hope the Giants defense can figure something out. Because they've been pretty okay. Going with the Giants. Philadelphia at the Jets. This one is. Oh. Fly, Eagles, fly. Are you taking the Eagles? All the way to victory. Because, unfortunately, I told myself I can't pick the Eagles. Exactly. And I You can't do not, pick the Eagles. I don't like the Jets in this game. So take the Jets. And I have to. Yes. I'm taking the Jets. Fly, Eagles, fly. Wait, no. Act. Uh. Mm-hmm. You you can't take the Eagles. That is the one, that is the one thing you promised you'd stick to. I took the Eagles in a draft survivor pool. That's not this podcast. <laughs> okay, taking the Jets. Hopefully, this will be all crazy pseudo karma to win me some money. Indianapolis at Houston. Is Tyrod starting? Uh, did he get hurt last game? I don't even remember. I don't pay attention to the He played last game, so he should be fine. So, yeah, they should be playing. Then I know who you're taking. I'm not taking Tyrod Taylor. 
against Jonathan Taylor right now? Are you kidding me? Have you seen this Houston defense? I mean, kind of, yes. You can take the Houston team. I'm taking Indy. Mm, Joey, the big Carson Wentz defender. No, not really. Nick give, Foles, baby. Give me Wentz. Yeah. Yep. I think Indy's starting to play better. Washington at Vegas. This is a good one. I think this is a good I'm one. I'm wasting no time. Okay. Give me the Raiders. I feel like this is going to backfire. Okay. Because Washington just flip-flops from good yep. to terrible. And I wanted to take Washington in this game. Antonio Gibson finally looked healthy, actually, which was weird because he's been running around with hurt shins all season. But he looked good. Heineke looked pretty solid. I still think their defense is getting there. They're not there yet, but they're getting there. They're starting to look better. Um, and they got a, a decently big game on Monday night. But Seattle, so they are a mess. Jacksonville at the Rams. Stafford has to get it together. He does, because if he loses... Pick sixes and three straight if games. If he loses this game at home, the Lions are in a top 20 pick. <laughs> I'm almost rooting against them at this point. Just just write it down. Yeah. Just, just write it down. Yep. All right, Malik. This is it. Baltimore, Pittsburgh. Baltimore, Pittsburgh. You can't pick Baltimore. Are you serious? I am serious. I can't pick Baltimore? No, you're a Pittsburgh fan. Then I'll pick Pittsburgh. Okay, good. Because I'm taking Baltimore. Okay. Because I can't take Pittsburgh. This is our rivalry okay. of our secondary teams. I'm going to take another chance just to help you out, too. San Francisco at Seattle. I'm taking Seattle. <laughs> I'm scared Russ is going to bounce back at some point. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> All right, I'll take San yeah. Francisco. They've been running the ball, and like we saw, Washington ran the ball all over the Seahawks. If the Washington football team can do it, I'm pretty sure San Francisco can do it. Seattle's dead. They're it's trouble. over. They're in trouble. <laughs> it's over, and Pittsburgh needs to get everything together. We too. need to start talking about where Russ is going to go next year. It would be nice to see him in Pittsburgh. <laughs> But knowing them, look weird. knowing them, they're going to give Ben another chance. Yeah. They're going to send uh, Russ to the Mile High Club in Denver. Denver at Kansas City. Denver just blew out the Chargers. Kansas City coming off a bye. I can't take the risk. I can't see it. You I can, think though. No, I can't. You can, though. I can't. I'm going with Kansas City. Come on. No. Nah. Come on. We've already gotten You got to risk two, it to win. Three. We've only got five differences, but that's fine. You got to risk it to win. No, I got to go with Kansas City. You got to risk it. Coming out of the bye. Give this me might Kansas be a, City. This might be a week I have to play it safe. <laughs> Maybe next week I can go all out. New England at Buffalo. This is a big one. New England is on fire. And Buffalo is trying to find their way back to being will, on fire. Will Mac Jones be inspired by Michigan's win over Ohio State? Oh, wait, that's another question. Exactly. This is not Tom. No, not. I don't think it's Tom, but you might. Now, Michigan, I mean, the, the Patriots do have quite a few Michigan players. Mm -hmm. So I'm taking the Patriots. Okay. Josh Uche, Chase Winovich, Michael Onwenu, the fighting New England Wolverines. And Buffalo's going to win that game. Hail to the Patriots. I think that'll be a good game because it's for the division lead at the time. So, yeah. Wow, we went through picks really fast this week. Um, is there anything else you want to talk about? We got like five minutes. Anything important? Anything important? That came up? Um, uh, I mean, I th up? we forgot to mention Billy Napier being uh, – hired by Florida in college football. He was the first hire before Lincoln Riley and Brian Kelly. Yeah. I think it could be an amazing move, but hiring a coach from group of five is always a risk. But seeing what Billy Napier did at Louisiana these past few years, seeing the recruits he was able to pull 
away from bigger schools to bring into Louisiana and have 10 win seasons, 10 and 11 win seasons. He's a guy that can build a program. Mm -hmm. And I believe he could be the guy for the future for Florida that could be there for however many years, maybe 10, 11, even more. Yeah. I think they made a great hire in Billy Napier. There it is. But it is a risk. DeAndre Swift might be out for multiple weeks. Just sit him the rest of the season, please. Save the one good talent that we have. Move the franchise. No. They need to be here in Detroit. Listen. But what I'll tell you is the NFL needs to force the Fords to sell the team. If they don't go the Baltimore Ravens route, Cleveland fans were devastated when Cleveland first left. Mm -hmm. But four years later, they had a team again. Yeah. The Browns were back. Yeah. Now they sucked again for a long time. Yeah. But they've had a few years of success. Detroit needs to move the franchise to somewhere. I don't know. But do you really think? I don't it, know. Do you but really? they need to rebrand with a new name. You could stay in Detroit. Well, look at what just happened name. with St. Louis. They need new ownership. They need a new GM. They need a new everything. Being the Detroit Lions will never work. One playoff win in over 50 years. Well, just think, if, if Michigan wins the national championship, your boy, Aiden Hutchinson, will be a Detroit Lion. There's a chance that everybody's saying he should be the top pick. Yep. Honestly, I want him to win the Heisman more than anything. If he if he goes crazy in this, if he goes into the playoff with 15 or 16 sacks, he deserves to be in New York, and he should get a real chance. It's hard for a defensive guy to do it. It is, but this is one of those weird years where there's no number one standout guy. There's a bunch of talented guys, but there's no number one standout. Maybe. We'll just have to wait and see. That's pretty much all I got. Yeah. Talking about the Lions is disappointing. Anyway, this has been Views from the Sidelines. We will go over some championship games next week. We'll talk about the Big Ten ACC Challenge because we'll be able to Get a little more information on some of these teams. And then, uh, yeah, we'll be in week 14 of the NFL. Season's winding down already. Then we'll get into the thick of the NBA. And then we're in the new year. It's going fast and crazy. We'll see you guys next time. Ohio State fans already can't handle losing to Michigan after a long time. So petty. Booking hotel rooms and making sure Michigan fans can't get them in Indianapolis. Get over it. You have a whole other year to live through it. And we will see you in in Columbus. They just can't handle the truth. Rivalry renewed. Go Blue.